When I was in Bible college uh, in the uh, mid to late 70s, I had a roommate named Nathan Faxon. Nathan uh, now lives, well, he grew up actually in Eddyville and Toledo in that area. Great guy, uh, kind of a car guy, but we got along really well. We were in uh, what they call the Soundview 36. We were in an apartment that was right across the street from the campus. And uh, we had a, a rather unique situation. It was a large apartment. It was a big three-bedroom apartment. And there were two guys per room. And uh, some of us were a bit more hygienic than other folks. Uh, Jenny loved coming to the apartment, but she refused to go to the bathroom there. Actually, she didn't particularly like going to the apartment. We needed other places. But I remember Nathan and I were grooming together. And uh, we had bunk beds. I was on the bottom. He was on the top. And he had his alarm clock rigged to the speakers in, in his room there. So whenever he turned his radio on, it sounded like the Doobie Brothers were doing a concert in our room. So um, anyway, so when the alarm went off uh, first night, beep, 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 I'm just louder than anything. And Nathan's kind of pawing around, finds that he put it right up on the level near where he was. And that worked out great, but it always take him a while, and I wouldn't wake up until he got up and then kicked me in. I woke up, and consequently, we were kind of late for class a few times. And uh, so he said, well, I got an idea. I read somewhere where if you put your alarm clock across the room, then you have to actually get up to go shut it off. When you're up, you're up. Okay, sounds like a good theory. So we put the speakers and all that nonsense on the other side of the room. And so that first morning, um, the, the alarm clock went off, beep, 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 sound like an air raid siren. And I woke up and I watched Nathan who had, it hadn't registered, I think, that he had moved his alarm clock because they see this arm reaching out and reaching out. I was fully wicked because I thought, ooh, this can be good. <laughs> And of course, you know what happened. Nathan goes, whomp, falls out of bed. He sits up kind of dazed. I said, good morning, Nathan. Are you awake? He wasn't pleased with my humor at that time of the morning. But um, yeah, we started waking up better, actually. Um, the theme, wake up, is really one we're going to be talking about today in the book of Revelations. We continue our series through this most fascinating and mysterious book. Um, Jesus is uh, giving direct revelation to uh, John the Apostle and uh, telling him to deal with these seven churches. Like week we did a uh, few we're finishing up with today, all on the theme. Um, so we see here a person, uh, this is why I'm not necessarily a cat person, but that's okay. You know, so are you awake? How about now? Uh, so he's either going to get woke up or the cat will shave him. For him. So, yeah, probably better wake up. Any of you have cats probably have this happen. Even your coffee is surprised you woke up this early. And if I ever saw my coffee looking at me like that, I think I'd go back to bed. I don't know about the rest. <laughs> go start the morning a little bit later on. Time to wake up and ensure the snooze button is broken. Well, that's not a bad idea. Just disconnect the wire. And there. Now, this next one is more of a visual image. And I want you to see if you've ever felt like this next one. I have a lot. <laughs> I can relate to that dog. <laughs> Can't get the coffee poured fast enough, and I'm not sure if he's going to be able to drink it anyway, but uh, he's obviously having some issues there. So the title is wake up. And we're going to look at these last few churches in the book of Revelation. And within those churches, we find three iconic sayings. In other words, sayings are scriptures that are familiar to a lot of people, even in and out of the church. And I want us to kind of put those back in context and see some uh, new meaning that we can get. So <laughs> you have your Bibles, you can read along, you can read up here. Uh, Revelation chapter 3. Getting in verse 1, again, if you see an A there, that means I had to split the verse into two slides here. That or we'd have to really scrunch up to read it. 
and I got to scrunch up anyway. I found out yesterday that I'm going to have to have cataract surgery at some point. And so if I look out with my right eye, it's good. I look at it with my left eye. Oh, you look better when I look at you with my left eye. But sorry, sorry. A little humor this morning. You're obviously like Nathan, right? Okay. You will see better than you have ever seen. What's that? You will see better than you have ever seen. Oh, wow. Okay. Then there's not to be an excuse for me cleaning up my desk. I can't say that I see it. Okay, sorry. This will be a mixed bag. We'll be praying for me all the next few months. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation, reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast. But if you do not wake up, now here comes the first iconic saying, I will come like a thief, and you know not and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not spoiled their clothes, they will walk with me dressed in white, for they our worry, the one who is victorious, will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. We'll talk about all that a little bit in later weeks. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is a common phrase that you're going to find through here. It kind of finishes up each section with this phrase. In other words, Put the Greek together, here's the translation, see if you can follow it. Okay, it's a little complicated. Listen up! That's what it's saying, essentially. Pay attention! Something we say to our kids all the time, or my wife says to me about every other day, yeah. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Do you know Philadelphia is in the Bible? Okay, Philego is one of the... Uh, words for love, we translate love, it gets translated five different ways in the Greek. Um, phileo is, is brotherly love, kindred love. It's Philadelphia, the city of love. To the angel in the church of Philadelphia, right? These are the words of him who is holy and true, which holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed you before an open door so that no one can shut. I know that you have a little strength, yet you've kept my word, you've not denied my name. Pretty good um, encouragement for a church who everybody was being tortured at that time. Get hauled off, get tortured, you might come back, you may not, probably won't. I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan. Love that phrase, isn't it? These are people who are obviously not following God who claim to be Jews, although they are not, but they are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to ensure patiently, I will also keep you from uh, the hour of that trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never, never again will they leave it. I will write them on the name of my God, on the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the faithful and true witness of the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds. Here comes the next iconic saying, that you are neither cold or hot. I wish that you were either one or the other. Because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. There are other translations for this word. Vomit, spew, is the good King James word, I'll spew you from my mouth. 
uh, puke bar for Alpha, you know, whatever the new translation is coming. You get the idea. It's disgusting. It ain't standing in God's mouth. You see, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth, and I do not need anything. You, but do you not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked? I, of course, to you to buy from the gold refined in the fire, so that you become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those who I rebuke and discipline, those who I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I might state, here's the next iconic statement. Here I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We pray with me this moment. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement. We also thank you for the admonitions that you give to us as you gave to those churches so many years ago to be able to, to see what we were doing right, to use that, to be able to conquer to what we were doing wrong, and to be the church and the people and the individuals that you have us to be. Guide us through our study this morning. Speak through your servant, your uh, spirit speaking through your humble servant, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Three phrases, and I pointed them out to you, a lot of other good stuff in here, but here are the phrases that we hear. Uh, Jesus comes like a thief in the night. Be careful. He comes uh, as a thief in the night. When I was in high school, there was, um, there was a film that came out. Now, in those days, you couldn't just go down to the store and rent a movie. Now, that, was an un that, that wasn't even a concept. You waited for the movie to come to the theater. You watched it a few times. I had to explain this to a young person one time. It's crazy. And then it went into movie heaven, or movie hell, depending on what kind of movie it was. And uh, it might come on TV if you're lucky, but you kind of miss it. Okay? You can't go down to the video store. We can't stream it on Netflix. We can't do. They couldn't do those kind of things. But we had a 16 millimeter thing that we rented. Remember those? 16 millimeter big old thing, and our church rented it. I must have been a couple of times, and so we showed up one night, and it was called, um, it was called uh, Left Behind. And, uh, boy, I'll tell you what, it wasn't a horror movie, it's actually supposed to be an encouraging movie, but that film scared me half to death. It did, I, I was scared, and I, at that point, think, wow, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, I know Jesus Christ, I know that if I die, I'm going to heaven. I had all that in my head, but boy, that thing just rattled my thinking. Um, and it, it had a song, I won't sing the whole thing, but life was filled with guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wished we'd all been ready. Is that a familiar song? Some of you, okay, can you see? Um, you haven't heard it, Glenn? Oh, I'll have to play it for you. Okay, it gets more personal as you go through it. But Jesus will come as a thief in the night. Now, why was this important to this church? Well, in Sardis, Sardis is on the coast of what now is Western Turkey. And Sardis was built like uh, a more familiar uh, place that you might have heard more of, Masada. It was built literally on a hill, on top of the mountain. And didn't tour Sardis, but I did tour Masada when I was there in 99. And first of all, I had to climb these unrealistic steps. They were talking about putting an elevator in there, which would have been nice. But you climbed up this thing, and you could see the whole valley. You could see planes flying over. It was the Israeli army practicing bombing runs. <laughs> yeah, loads of fun. Anyway, but it was, it was high up. You could see down all the sides. In other words, you could see when an enemy was coming up. Uh, there was no hidden spots or clefts or anything in there that people could hide from. 
And so it was up on a hill. Sardis was the same way. It was up on that kind of a hill because it was thought to be unconquerable. However, the city did get conquered twice in its history. And uh, one isn't as much familiar to us, but the second one was in 546 BC, and this name may be familiar to you, King Cyrus of the Persians. And you remember in the Old Testament when the nation of Israel was obliterated by the Assyrians, those were left stayed in the, in the area. Then the Babylonians came again from the east and conquered what was left of them and took some of the most intelligent, bright and all that, back to Babylon, to the east. The story of Daniel, and those are a part of the Babylonian captivity. And they were promised that they would again get to go back into their promised land. Now, when King Cyrus came on board, he was actually one of the nicer kings. And a little apathetic, too. In other words, I don't want all these people around. I have to watch them. I have to feed them. I have to clothe them. Ah, go, back to where you, go back to your home. I'm going to go back to your home, fine, I'm not going to chase you, I'm not going to bother you, just get out of here. <coughs> Believer's modern translation, okay? So he sends the folks away from Persia, back to the Promised Land, they begin rebuilding the wall, the temple, the whole bit, you find that, especially in Haggai, Zephaniah, Malachi, and those latter books, you see that history about the rebuilding of the temple and rebuilding of the church. And so he says to this city, who thought that nobody could conquer it, watch out. I am coming like a thief in the night. Jesus' coming will be totally unexpected. And the reason it will be unexpected is because many of us uh, have a sense of complacency. We talked about that last week with losing your first love. You didn't exactly lose it. It just became insignificant to the place where you could very easily leave it somewhere. And here, the same way, Jesus comes like a thief in the night. And we're always to be ready. Every day, not just Sunday, not just Bible study night, not just worship team practice, not just youth group in those areas. I mean, those all help us to be ready, don't they? And our small groups are great. I'm glad some of them are coming. They're, some are meeting uh, in person. Some are doing Zoom and remote stuff. We're kind of using the technology. But each one of us needs to be ready. How do you do that? We meditate. We think. We pray. We read from the scripture. And we know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? Yes. And we do. And that he is coming at any time. <laughs> when... We were first married. Um, Joni worked as an executive secretary for the uh, for the president, right, at uh, uh, Lynn Benton Community College. It was quite a uh, quite a prestigious job. She was really in the high part of the uh, secretaries there. And of course, I'd come in and say, "Hey, honey, I want you to quit your nice new job where I'm going to graduate school in Tennessee." <laughs> yeah, maybe not one of my brighter moments. But at any way, she had this. Uh, she had this great job. Well, occasionally she'd have to go off for some training or retreats or what have you. So I was left to my own devices. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll say that the house didn't maintain the level of cleanliness that Joni was accustomed to. Okay? So guys, let's see if you got this. I would always, I got to the place where I'd ask my wife, okay, when are you coming home? Specifically, when? Coming home Wednesday about 5 o'clock. Great. What time did I start cleaning up? Quarter to 5. Okay, yeah. I got smarter and, and spaced it out a little bit earlier. But I, I, I wanted that to be pristine because when we leave the house, if we're gone for a few days or whatever else, Johnny likes the kitchen clean. We clean it, get it all ready because she doesn't want to come home to a dirty kitchen. Can't say as a blamer. So I get that all done. Occasionally she snuck home earlier. But you guys know how it goes. That's the same thing about being ready. We don't know when Jesus is coming. <coughs> As a matter of fact, I love it when people <laughs> say they know when the second coming is. I'll probably tell you this before, but I, what was it? 2016, I can't remember the year. But uh, we were here. But um, 
this guy named uh, Pastor Camp. You remember this guy? This guy stood up, he, he ministered someplace. <coughs> Excuse me. No COVID, dry throat, sorry. Um, he, he said, if the Lord is going to come October 21st on this year at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, I was greatly relieved because I knew for a fact that Jesus wasn't going to come October, you know, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But I had a wedding that day over in Canby, over at the park, under the gazebo. It's a nice place, nice couple. Anyway, so of course I have to sneak a little something into the wedding just to be a little fun. We're standing there, kind of getting started, and I said, well, guys, um, the world's coming to an end in three hours. So I'm going to see if I can hustle through this ceremony and get your honeymoon going, okay? We only have three hours left. Well, of course, three o'clock came and went, and six o'clock came and went, and uh, Reverend Campus, he came and went too, all right? I always like to read these guys after that, but he didn't have anything to say. Be ready, okay? Because we don't know the day or the hour to be ready. The second one that comes up with is that we are to be hot or cold, not lukewarm. All right? We're to be hot and cold. Now, as people look at this passage, a lot of times we want to, we're tempted to allegorize it. And what I mean by that is saying, well, okay, he wants me to be hot, not cold. People kind of misread it. So you're going to be hot in your relationship with Christ. Uh, Paul told the, told the Thessalonians, do not quench the spirit. I was wrong, excuse me. Told the Romans not to let the Spirit be quenched. The Spirit of God knows the fire. And uh, uh, keep, keep hot in your relationship. Don't get cold. Don't let it get cold. But that's not exactly what it says. Hierapolis was located at one end in this area in Asia Minor near Laodicea. Was a, uh, a place on a hill, again, and it was a part, it had hot springs. Is that hot spring around here called the Bagby Hot Springs? Never been there, but I've heard about it. And uh, don't know if it's good or bad. I don't really plan on visiting, so I'm not gonna worry about it. But at any rate, it had natural hot springs there. And it was quite known for its high mineral content. And so it was known for its healing powers. It could help with arthritis, back pain, all these other kinds of uh, things. Of course, it claimed to cure other things too, but that was more or less what it was for. And some of us were walking around with arthritic limbs, hey, sitting there, and that's great. Laodicea was six miles away, and it was known for a mountain spring that came off, and the water was just ice cold. But it's like hiking on a glacier into that ice cold with our youth group. Boy, that was the best tasting water off of that glacier I've ever had in my life. We didn't even think of bottled water. We didn't think of bottled water in the 70s. I mean, come on. But I got a bottle of that stuff made a fortune. Because it's it's nice cold water. Now, so that Laodicea, like other churches, get on some of these kind of bright, wild ideas that look great on paper, but when you do them, huh, not so much. Okay, we want hot water in Laodicea. Oh, we got this spring of cold water, so we're gonna build an aqueduct from Ropolis down to Laodicea, okay, great. So the hot water comes down here, it gets mixed in with that spring water. And incidentally, the spring water was known for being ice cold and refreshing. Hot, dead, you ever been, in, you ever been in that part of the world? It's hot, dry, no humidity, and uh, it, temperatures in that area can reach easily 110 without worrying about it. That's why they wear a lot of level of clothing to actually cool them off. And so that was cool and refreshing. The hot water gets piped in through the aqueduct. That's what happens. It hits the cold water of the mountain spring of Laodicea, and you put hot water and cold water together. Guess what you get? You're lukewarm. And uh, you spit it right out. It's natural. It's a bit off to drink. I can manage lukewarm coffee, but lukewarm water just doesn't quite do it for me. So for this people in Laodicea, this made perfect sense. Jesus wanted them to be either hot in terms of being a healing body where people could come and get salvation 
which also simply means wholeness. So not only your spirit, who knows Christ and comes to him, can live forever with Christ, but also your body and your emotions. It was a place to get rest and it was a place to uh, receive healing, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. Or he also wanted you to be cold. In other words, cold, refreshing. I mean, we're under a, I, I think we're in a culture right now that seriously needs some refreshment. Don't you? Needs some good news. Needs something to say, oh, yeah, that is so good. Like jumping into a kid's waiting pool on a hot day, chasing the grandkids out. And, no, I don't. <laughs> I just stand outside the waiting pool. They splash enough. I get plenty wet. I don't have to go in there, actually. But you get what I mean? The church actually has two aspects here. The hot is a healing uh, thing of mind, soul, body, and spirit, and also to be a refreshment. We're called to be salt light, flavor, preserve, and keep. We're also called to be warm and healing. We meet, we meet everybody who needs healing. You want to find out where your mission field? Walk out your front door, walk down the street a few feet. There's your mission field. You see it right there. God drops it in front of you. This hot and cold was also illustrated through our food gift. Last week was food gift, and uh, we had we postponed it a week because of uh, a little hard to deliver food when your entire town is evacuated. Didn't want to drive that far. So we, okay, well, yeah, we'll put it off that last week. So we did that. And we have, uh, we have a ton of refrigerators and freezers down the basement over here. And, but Alan White, a number of years ago, took one of the storage closets when being used. He went in there, cleaned it out, insulate, it, heavy insulation, more three times the insulation you'd ever put in any room in your house and made it the cold bot room. Hooked an air conditioner, and it keeps that room about 34 degrees. Right, Alan? In there somewhere? Okay. So we got that cold room, and so you get produce and stuff like that on the truck on Wednesday, and it's still gotta be good for Thursday. Put it in there, and it stores it, keep eggs in there, and all sorts of things. It's great, kind of like a walk-in refrigerator, and done a really good job with it. Except for this week, our walk-in refrigerator was not 34 degrees, it was 55 degrees. Oops, all right? And uh, so, uh, so um, they tore it apart and got it everything out of there, looked at the air conditioning, looked at everything. And then Alan did something that he, he broke the man code. He just shattered it. What's the man code? Nope. 10 commandments for man, command number 12 says this, Thou shalt not read the instruction book under any circumstances. Okay? Alan went off the beaten path, you know, he became a backslider, so he read the book, and he finds out that there's some, some, uh, he and Russ were doing this, and they find out that there are some filters in that air conditioner, and in that unit, which we know that. It's been sitting there for three years, ran perfect. Another thing in the man code, if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? It's working great. Problem is he found out these filters in the air conditioner, and I tell this with his full permission and blessing, that those filters need to be replaced probably about a couple times, three times a month. We've been doing it every three years. I'm not a mechanic. I do, do not have that as a spiritual gift but I think we need to replace the filters a little more often. What do you think? So he, they replaced them, took it all apart, put all the filters back in, put it all back together, guess what? Nice 34 degrees. And I know for a fact every month we're gonna get you know, something, hey, gotta go check those crazy filters, okay. But see, we needed cold, right? We needed cold. Lukewarm 55, wasn't gonna do it. It'd kill us, literally. But cold is what we needed. The last one. And this one, this one you see pictured. You see God standing at the door and knock. 
And many times we read this as an evangelistic passage. In other words, he's standing at the door of people who don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, and he's knocking on the door. Won't you let him in? Won't you let him uh, uh, save you from your sins? Great thing, but that's not the audience of the passage. The audience is the church. The audience is the church. And Jesus is knocking on our door. Why is Jesus knocking on the door of the church? He should already be inside, right? We should feel the presence of God in here. Where else would we expect him to be? I'm not going to go down to Safeway. Get a religious experience down there. I like Safeway, incidentally. No offense to Safeway employees. But why is he knocking? Because they're lukewarm. They're disobedient. They lost their first love. And Jesus knocking is such a you know, rap, rap, rap. Jesus is pound, pound, pound. Wake up! We're evacuating. Really? Sound like something that's familiar? Even me, I'm I'm here, it's stupid me. Yeah, it's level two, but I'm not leaving until so many knocks on my door, including in that red. That red day we had on that Wednesday, remember that? We looked like Mars. Crazy stuff. Still in five. I'm not going anywhere. Should have. That's when all my neighbors left. <laughs> we had the only ones left in the cul-de-sac. But oh, maybe, nope. Somebody's got to knock on my door. Sure enough, we come into the church. Church is still at, is, is at level three. If you're down here, you'd be able to be evacuated. Well, we lived in a, not a, in a two and worked in a three. So we're down here just be bopping around, and all of a sudden we get a knock on the door. And it was a fairly emphatic knock. And this nice police officer opened the door and said, get out. Come on. He wasn't rude about it. He wasn't particularly polite about it. For good reason, we had to move, right? The church needs to move, not to a different building, like we talked about last week in that illustration. But we need to wake up and be doing what we need to be doing because here's, here's the thing, folks. We are really part of the first responders, aren't we? we? Because we have to offer people life and life abundance, eternal life, life abundance. That's what we have to offer people. Jesus offers it. We need to tell it. We need to show it. We need to model it. We need to be hot and healing, cold, refreshing, Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night. In other words, we don't know. But I, every day I seem to get a phone call. This virus, why are we having this virus? Let me give you a theory, okay? Because everything that happens, God either causes or allows. Well, he's not going to cause calamity, nor is he going to cause sin. James tells us he doesn't do that. Why does he then allow the virus for the church to wake up? And it's getting deadly out there. Because if somebody is even cured of COVID, but they don't know Jesus, it's as bad as if they still have the disease. Because it will still be the ultimate thing. Make sense? So no matter what their physical shape is, we need to work on the spiritual shape. And the revival has to start within the church. And revival in the church needs to start with each individual here, including the idiot up here. We need to be doing revival here so that it will go out in the community. And I'm, this isn't just our church, folks. I know the preachers in the other churches. They're preaching the same thing. They're getting the same questions. Is this the end times? Well, do. Well, I, I don't say that. I'm usually more tactful than that. I, I try to be way more tactful. So, well, you know what? I really think we are. I think we're in the end times. I think that we are undergoing the great tribulation right now. We have Antichrist every 10 feet telling us that they are the truth. Maybe they're trying to sell us something. Maybe they're trying to get us to join something. They're trying to get us to like their Facebook page. I'm seeing it all over Facebook. It's crazy. And they offer the solution. We're the solution. We're the way. I didn't you guys go to Sunday school? I love that phrase from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes from the Father except by me. When 
trying to evacuate. I just need that one road that's going to get me out of town. I'm not going to meander around through the streets of town, just kind of wave to the neighbors. If I got evacuated, folks, I'm heading to higher ground. I'm taking a straight line. Did you? Took the best way to get there? Maybe the only way to get there? And that way is cleared and paved for you. 1926, there were these two men, William Shire and Grant Wood. They were both living in Paris. Uh, Shire was a writer, wrote poetry, novels, short stories, and uh, uh, Grant Wood, he was a painter. And they talked about being in Paris, and uh, there were Americans living in Paris, which was not totally uncommon in those days. And they were discussing their various crafts and their various gifts. And uh, Wood, the artist, actually came to me. He says, you know, I've been living in Paris for a long time. And when I get tired, I go back to my home in Iowa. And I find it so drab and boring and uninteresting, small town. Nothing ever goes on there. So I come back to France and I can paint these great landscapes and, and all of this. problem is, a lot of the famous painters in history are at France painting these wonderful landscapes like Monet and artists like that, and I can't measure up to that, and I'm really frustrated. So his writer said, friend said, what are you going to do? I'm going home. I'm going to my roots. I'm going to where I need to be. I'm going to rediscover who I am. Well, actually, we're really glad that he did, because how many here have heard of the painting American Gothic? Let me describe it for you. Probably more of you have heard it. It's in a field in Iowa. It's got a farmer with a pitchfork and his wife kind of in her work clothes. They look cheery as all get out. <laughs> uh, geez, don't you? Well, of course, if you're painting something, it's going to stand there for a few hours. I don't think I'd be looking too cheery either. So, But that iconic painting was a painter who came home to exercise his God-given gift for the majority of the people around him. Isn't that what we're called to do today? We're calling because we're getting ready to go home, folks. We don't know the day, we don't know the hour, but it's coming. If somebody says, are we in the last times, you'd better answer emphatically, yes. And all that last times means we better get our act cleaned up and get ready to go. And then, as we saw in, in around town, I love these stories where people were helping each other, getting packed and moving and, and doing keeping animals for some folks, a lot of great things. And we as a church need to be doing more of that to help people on that journey to get ready to go home. As we sing our song of invitation and dedication, I'll have Rob put it up on the screen for us. And yeah, Jesus is our peace. Peace I give to you, not as the world gives. But God, he gives our peace. He is our peace. And in this world with all sorts of turmoil, we need to experience that this morning and spread it on.